when it's warm, I don't really wear a lot of boots. But now that it's cooling off, I started wearing those Viberg natural shell 110 last boots. Pretty sweet. They're, they're the, na- the, yeah, they're nice. They're super nice. It's pretty nice. Are you doing, uh, the, th- are you going to do Thunderdome? I decided against it. Th- I'm going to sit this one out. Um, because the last time, like, I, w- I think we did a whole, <laughs> we talked, <laughs> a whole yeah, we talked a lot on this. Yeah. I like the, I really, really like the idea of it, of the stitch I'm pitching a Thunderdome. And there's some like really incredible, prizes and stuff so i would encourage people to do it especially if they want to wear want to wear something you knew that they haven't worn before but i have so many pairs that i i really love that i never wear so i don't want to put some miles on those uh and even like revisit some stuff that i have some pairs i've worn through the sole that i'd like to resole and wear those again so i guess i just feel like even if i won the prize by the way which I'm not trying to do, I would probably just give it to somebody else because like, I'm not necessarily interested in, in that. I think it's really generous. I've always wanted to see how leather wears in over a long term. So six months or however months, many months it is, is cool. But for me, it's like, what about six years or like 16 years, which is how long I've had some of these pairs for. Mm-hmm. So I, I like that aspect more. Like, I really want to wear the stuff. Same with wallets. Like, I'll, I'll have to wear test different things, but I always end up going back to ones I've worn because there's this, like, longevity. Like, I don't know. There's something about just having it for a long time. It just looks cooler and cooler. Where six months doesn't necessarily get it for me. Are, are you doing the... I was asking because I was trying to decide. Because <laughs> I didn't do it. Well, I kind of... I, I, did, I submitted, like, the first one. The, this this is what I'm wearing picture and then I didn't do anything beyond that I just oh for last time yeah I didn't so I didn't really do it but I have I have a few pairs in my office that are not new that I just haven't I just haven't worn I was thinking about what are they I should I will tell uh, you what to wear <laughs> I have. A pair of natural Chrome XL thousand miles that LaFoe did like a long time ago that I just never, that he, that, that I got from, um, Steven that he, and I just never wore them because I was like, oh, these are really nice. I'm going to keep them, I'm going to keep them in the box. Uh, but that those, makes sense. but those would, those would look after six months, like through the winter. I know, I know they'll be comfortable. And then a pair of, uh, Alan Edmund, I don't remember that. I don't know the style name. On Edmonds, the Higginsville, uh, they're wingtip boots, like wingtip, like Dalton, maybe they're not tall, they're like kind of like mid hmm. high boots, but they're those are cool. And I have worn those, right, obviously. What, what leather are those? Natural Chrome XL, also. Oh, cool. And then I've got some brown, uh, woolly Fibergs service boots. Like how them? mad it. How mad am I at myself? Do I want to have like a nice what are the experience on each of those? Um, well, on the thousand miles, it's just leather sole. On the on Emmons, I think it's a vibram, vibram, like tread. Like a, I think it might be like a gum color. Can't remember off offhand. And then the vibram, I think, is a Ridgeway. Hmm. I don't know if I could recommend the leather sole in the winter here. Oh, it's going to be. It was treacherous for you me. Gotta, you got to uh, fall down at least once a winter to keep yourself <laughs> to keep yourself honest. I uh, I think in that episode we did three months ago and a week, well, I had teased that I bought some Air Jordan. Yeah, I forget. They just they're still, come. They're still in the box. You haven't worn them yet. I haven't had time to make a. The, the goal was to do like an unboxing video and then talk about. What what is a suede and and what's a new buck and what's a split suede and and then like talk about it on the shoe and like hopefully get some people to like follow my YouTube channel or whatever and I just haven't had a chance to even do that so I'd rather do the podcast here with you today instead of unboxing some yeah I mean I kind of I'm well you're talking about not wearing them I think I might wear them or the Jordans I think you should wear them yeah I don't I get I get the collecting sneakers thing i don't understand why 
stuff is rare though other than for the sake of making it rare well we just did an episode about rare cordovan yeah well we we don't want it to be that rare yeah <laughs> like, we would make more <laughs> we would definitely make more and uh, i mean it's a kind of, you know with, if we had more people and more material we would make more uh but yeah it's not like when you're making i mean how many pairs of shoes do you think nike makes a week couple two tree Two, two, three. I mean, thousands, right? Yeah, many tens thousands. of thousands, yeah. maybe more. I don't even. I, I I can't even. I can't even guess because they have they own Converse and all the Nike brands up and down, and a few other brands and a lot of shoes. It's a lot of shoes. So I mean, like, why? So like, oh, these are green. <laughs> this when the swoosh is white. So there. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm then. I'm not detracting from the collect the people that collect it. Cause I get it. Cause I, there's, there's nothing that makes, I'm going to sound like a shithead, but it does, it does. Something does happen where it gets more appealing if it's exclusive and you can't, it's never, hard to get. Yeah. Never again, but they are re-releasing the old stuff, which diminishes the value of the actual old stuff. Right. I get it. It's like, it's cool. Cause it's a time. Ca- it's like a time machine. We go back into the nineties and buy whatever hideous nineties sneakers that are now cool again. I I get it. It'd be like if somebody, okay, 1940s calf that is sitting at at the tannery and it's dwindling away. If you could reproduce that, you would bring that back because it's Mm, really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And something like that, but, but because you, because you suck. Right. I don't know the story why you can't do it. We it's lost the never, formula. We don't have the formula anymore. Never figured out how to do it again. But because of that, you know, it, it's actually never going to happen, which is sad. But also, like you said, it makes it a treasure. All right. I tried to buy, uh, for some reason I got in my head, speaking of Nike, I was like, I want, I want, uh, you remember the, the bow nose campaign? Yes. I was oh, like, Jackson, I, want a, I want a bow nose t-shirt. Yeah. Because I that's just I for some reason I was thinking about it. A bonos t shirt's gonna run you about a hundred bucks <laughs> on, on eBay. I remember those ads were all black and white. And he played on the Raiders and the White Sox. So everything and he did was, was black the, and white. Was it the White Sox? Yeah, dude. He lived in Chicago. Look it up. He I, also I played on in the uh, on I the Royals. For, but yeah. Look it up. We'll play the Jeopardy. Angels and the White Sox. Angels. It wasn't Royals? Um, I remember seeing him in like a bright ass blue. I think I, I thought he played for the oh, the Royals, the White Sox, and then the Angels. Yeah. So I was just thinking like his ads were all black and white and he was playing on these like black and white teams. It's pretty cool. Like that. Uh, he Like I associate his name with that aesthetic for some reason. Bo Jackson is very good. We are the Bo Jackson of podcasts. Yeah. Like. I'm just going to call this the Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson show. hour. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's get into the show, Nick. Okay. Question from the audience. Hi, Phil and Nick. Thanks for answering my previous question during the podcast. Really enjoy all the new episodes. Thank you. I'm, that's me saying thank you. I got a new question on leather smell. What usually determines the nice smell from Horween leather? Is it actually the tannings used or is there something else to it? And then he goes to say, also, I purchased this leather jacket. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I'll paraphrase. Not sure what kind of leather it is. Um, it doesn't smell good. Were there pictures on that? There were. Yeah. I'll, I'll put up pictures. Yeah. In the, so everybody uh, sent questions. Thank you guys so much for sending those in. Uh, I read all the comments on YouTube and uh, eventually I will read all the emails, but if you guys have good questions or, or any questions, we will answer them on the show. So send them to full grain podcast at gmail.com or just leave a comment on YouTube. It's not really a good way to interact with podcasts except for on YouTube and email, unfortunately, because they're all what is it, disaggregated. Also send Phil good Bo, Bo Jackson videos. He loves those. <laughs> I will read and watch all those videos. Uh, so send your question. Seriously. We, that's our favorite part is answering things that like we, 
we're too close to the subject, so it's really helpful to to be able to answer questions like this one. So Nick, the question seems to be a lot about hot stuffing and then scent of leather. And I know that the term hot stuffing, maybe we unpack that a little bit first, but it is a process that the tannery Horween does that's a little bit more rare these days. So what is hot stuffing and why would you do it? Why aren't people doing it? So hot stuffing is the the conditioning or the nourishing of leather using unrefined or less refined greases, fats, and oils that are solid at room temperature. So that distinction is important because most of the conditioning that happens or most of the time when you're introducing oils to the leather in out in the larger world of tanning is done by emulsifying it. So you emulsify it with water and then you can do that as part of the retanning process. So to back up, so you would tan chrome tan or or do your whatever base tans you're going to use. And then you would retan, which involves you know, different extracts and dyes and extracts can be veg or not, um, or approximate veg. And then you would then, <laughs> Then you would then, you idiot. <laughs> and after and then, and then you would then. All right. Uh, so after the dyes are introduced, and the and the extracts, you would introduce the oils and the waxes and the fats, but they all have to be refined enough that you can emulsify them because you're going to carry them into the water or into the leather with water, uh, which is fine. It works. It works great in a lot of cases, uh, and. It gives you know, most of the leather in the world is tanned that way now. Otherwise, it would just sit up on top and just be like a greasy mess. It's kind of like, I always go back to the food example. It's kind of like making, let me think about like making mayonnaise. I make a lot of mayonnaise. So I guess this is a tough example, but <laughs> but the, you have to. Everybody makes mayonnaise. You have to emuls, use like the, you emulsify the oil with the egg yolk because the egg yolk is an emulsifier. So then it carry it it interacts and becomes like a, a homogeneous uniform mixture. Um, but imagine trying to make mayonnaise with like butter instead of oil. Yeah, what would you do? Then? You wouldn't. You would. You could never get the two. I mean, you kind. It's kind of. I guess that's not a great example. Just melt it, right? I guess that's a bad example. Cut that out. Imagine <laughs> trying to make mayonnaise with like paraffin instead of oil like you would just never even if you were to warm up the paraffin and melt it you could never get the two to to mix completely and then as soon as they as soon as and even if you could get to mix in some way as soon as you got as soon as things cooled off they would separate again so in hot stuffing hot stuffing is technically part of retaining you're just separating retaining into two steps so instead of doing the retaining with the extracts and the dyes, which I guess is considered part, like half of it, and then there's the, re, the conditioning, which is the second half. I mean, it's not necessarily done separate exactly like that, but we're separating out the conditioning part of it and doing that in a separate vessel with no water. Hey, let me, let me pause you for a second. <laughs> it makes sense to me because I'm familiar with it. I'm going to try to back it up just a tiny bit to get more clarity. It's not very intuitive. No, no, I mean, it makes a lot stuff. It is. makes a lot more sense to just like put it in there and then just have it's like a washing machine. You have different feeds and then it comes out and you're done with that step. The the thing that uh, connected it for me was uh, thinking about the tanning process. There's tanning the leather and then retanning the leather, which many people aren't aware of those two things are separated. It's my understanding that in the tanning process, you are removing the hair and you're removing all of the fats in the skin that are perishable and are going to rot. And later in the retaining process, we're reintroducing fats again that will give us a, a, perhaps a scent that this customer is alluding to or perhaps a different feel or a different you know, visual character. Water resistance, yeah, whatever the, whatever we, the attribute is. We reintroduce those fats, oils, greases, in a later stage called retanning, one of the ways to introduce those fats 
is in a special process called hot stuffing, but there's also wet stuffing. What are, are there other ways to introduce fats? Fat liquoring. Fat liquor. Yeah. Those are the three. Those are the three that we use. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, we separate it out so that you can use more traditional things that give you different. We do. So we do, I guess to back up, we do all the, those. We fat liquor, we wet stuff and we hot stuff and, and wet stuffing is sort of like a, like a in between, like where you're stuffing with things that you can emulsify, but it's not quite like fat, quite like fat liquoring. So, but the reason to separate it out is because we can use paraffin and beeswax and tallow and lanolin and things that don't, that don't, you can't emulsify, but they, but give you good leather characteristics in terms of how they feel and how things age and the water resistance. And, you know, the reason that you use those is because that's what was available. I mean, there, there weren't these complicated, you know, chemistry options to where you put everything in a drum and emulsify it and then it comes out and it's finished. I mean, back when tanning was being developed, you had the things that you had were beeswax and lanolin and tallow. So those are the traditional, the more traditional products to use. And they give you, it's different. It's a different product. I mean, and people don't, and I think you asked why don't people do it? Right. It's, I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of reasons. I mean, it's the materials are expensive. There's no spec. They're different every time because you're, you're dealing with tallow or or lanolin or thing. You know, things are they're refined. You know, the lanolin's coming from the from wool processing, and tallow is from you know the processing of beef and uh, you know, beeswax and paraffin or waxes. But um, so they're expensive. And then there's the, you have to separate out to a different step. So you have a whole other piece of equipment that you need and a whole extra hand, <clears throat> handling procedure that's, that has to go on to get it out of one drum and then into another drum. So it's more steps. So it's expensive. It's it takes expensive. A long and, time. and one that I think that the, all having said all that, the hardest part is actually doing it the right way. Um, because there's no, like when you're emulsifying during fat liquoring, like you can be pretty formulaic about it. You can be pretty like it needs, like this is how much water it goes in. And like, this is how much emulsifier goes in. And like, then you put it all in there and it's fine. But with, with um, hot stuffing, the only way we can control how much grease or wax or oil goes into the hide is by controlling the moisture in the hide itself because fat and oil and water can't occupy the same place at the same time. So we have to be very specific about how wet or dry the hides are when they go into the hot stuffing drums, because if they're too wet, then all of the grease doesn't make it into leather. It sits up on the surface. It makes everything feel greasy. It's a mess. And if it's too dry, then the grease gets sucked in to whatever it touches first and you end up with areas of the hide that are super dark because they get too much grease and other parts of the hide that are too dry. And that's further complicated by the fact that, you know, there are different, there are different, uh, the hide is made up of different densities of fibers. So the, the belly, you know, is, is less dense than the backbone. So that wants to take in more grease than the backbone. So we have to make sure that the belly is more, is, you know, has more moisture than the backbone, which is like kind of a nightmare. Yeah. You know, and then if stuff's going to sit over the weekend, is it the same if it, as if it, you stuff it just the next day? And then, you know, it's no. And then it's different at different times of the year. So there's a lot of, it's much more, I mean, this is the case in a lot of places in, in our process and in a lot of the traditional tanning process. It's a lot more like cooking than it is like chemistry where you're making adjustments and you just need people to know what they're doing and you have to make adjustments constantly depending on how thick things are and what the temperature is, the humidity and what the, the lot of wax looks like and, and all that. So those are the all, I mean, pretty compelling reasons to not do it. <laughs> um, and that, and then, and then you get to, you get all the way to the end of all of that. And then you end up with a product that you can't glue because it's got too much oil in it. So it has to be, you know, welted or sewn together 
in some way. Otherwise, they, it'll defeat the glue over time. So it's not, it, it's, it also lends itself to a specific kind of category of products. I hear a lot of negatives, Nick. Well, <laughs> well, so let's start with what products are hot stuff that you produce. Or I should say what articles of leather you produce are hot stuffed. Chrome XL and all of the Chrome XL derivatives or cousins. So XL and Cavalier and Buccaneer and Navigator and like all of those are sort of variations on the same theme with different, different extract blends in some cases and, and then different oil blends in other cases, depending on the product, but also it's all the same steps. It's just different, different formulations. And then Chrome pack, which is a straight Chrome leather that's hot stuffed, which is kind of a, an interesting concept. And it's like an undefeatable yeah. leather. What else I'm missing? How about Shell Cordovan? Well, Shell, yeah, Shell. <laughs> how could I forget? Shell Cordovan is hot stuffed. I mean, those are, those are, I mean, we can hot stuff a lot of stuff. All, all the strips, the horse hide strips are stuffed too. And there's a lot, we, we can stuff more stuff. It gives you a different product though. You know, to go back to it, like it just, if you're making a well, a, a welted shoe or a boot, like the, or a hand sewn where you're mechanically attaching the bottom and the welt to the leather, I mean, Chrome Excel is pretty tough to beat. It's water resistant. It looks nice. It ages well. It sort of polishes itself because there's enough oil in it. Um, so it's, it's, it's good in that realm. But if you want to make a pair of Air Jordans, you can't do it. I mean, you, you can't glue the soles on. You can glue it for a time, and then you'll go into your closet one day, and you'll pick up your Jordan the, the sole, the bottom will stay in the box and the upper will come off of it. This is why a company like Crown Northampton is making those shell cordovan sneakers. Because they're stitching the, yeah. The only way to do it. Together. Yeah. So in the, you know, so there's, it ages great and it performs really well. It's just hard to make. It's hard to make. And then the, the things that you can make out of it are limited. Um, many people, many people won't know what the hell Chrome Excel is, but many people listening to this show might. What would be the difference of a hot stuff versus versus a, a fat liquored or wet stuffed Chrome Excel? In terms of like final, like on a shoe, how would that appear differently? The you can approximate the look in terms of a finished shoe, like straight off the line, like pretty well, like it's not, it wouldn't be tremendously different looking if you were to make, you take the same Brown, you know, in three different stuffing methods, or three different conditioning methods, fat liquoring, wet stuffing and hot stuffing. And to make a shoe out of them and then just put them on top of the box and just look at them. If it was exactly the same shoe, I mean, it wouldn't be, the appearance would not be that different. I don't think, um, they would smell different. They would feel different if you were to pick them up, but you would start to notice them as soon as you start to wear them in terms of how, how they feel. And then aging would be a lot different. Also, you'll get a lot more. I mean, the, the more richly conditioned something is generally the longer it will last. So age is a little, I guess it's subjective, but ages in a more pleasant way to some people, the hot stuff stuff. Uh, it does. Interesting. I think it ages better. I mean, it tends to, it tends to look better as you. There's like no counterfactual here either, because there's no. Or is there a wet stuffed Chrome Excel type? Mm -hmm. What's that called? Ruffian. I like Ruffian though. Yeah. Longitude is the is the corrected version. So that you say on a shoe, it's not as well aging as Chrome Excel. It's not. Well, it's not. It's it's a tough direct comparison because it's dried differently also because one of the compelling reasons to, to wet stuff or fat liquor or something and not hot stuff it is because we can, you can paste it. We can paste it or we can toggle it or we can vacuum dry it maybe depending on how oily it is. But, but so it's dried differently. So you get a different, a different wear characteristic because of that, because the, the hot stuffed from Excel 
gets air dried uh, for a variety of reasons, but that that has a gigantic effect in the on the finished product on making on the density because it's allowed to shrink and sort of fill itself in and get dense that way. In addition to the density that gets added from all the tree barks and everything. Yeah, you know what? Now that I think about it, the reason I like Ruffian is because of that compacted grain look. It's full grain. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was a tough example. Especially because it puts you on the spot because it makes you say like, well, both one of the products of mine is worse. It's like, well, why don't you hot stuff everything, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's like, well, it's not worse. It's just different. You know, it's right. it's got a different grain character. It's not stretchy. It's not, doesn't have pull up. And it's less expensive. I mean, it's it's easier. The, the, we get better yield. So yeah, it you ends would up much being, rather make big pasted leather all day if people pay the same price as opposed to something that's hot stuffed. It's, it's faster and it's bigger, bigger and the materials are, the process is easier to control. Yeah. But it's a different, it's a different product. So, I mean, they don't, I don't view one, I don't view one as a substitute for the other in any way. They're just different. Yeah. Just, just different ways to use the same materials. It's kind of like uh, going to Taco Bell. You get the same, it's like the same seven ingredients, just arranged different ways, but they're all <laughs> different. Right. It is like going to Taco Bell. You're right. Okay, the point in I question... I must be hungry. This is like directly to the point is I've noticed that as Chrome Excel has become a longer lead time for myself and other customers, to me much a less extent, but certainly um, a company like Allen Edmonds, all the like larger footwear brands are looking to get more Chrome Excel. At least this was about a year ago and they couldn't source it. So some alternatives have come out that are market. It's my understanding they're marketing themselves as like, hey, this is just like Chrome Excel, but it's not hot stuffed. Um, so I guess the question is in there is like, how mad are you about that? And is it the same? <laughs> I always have to give two questions, apparently. I can't just ask one. Is it the same? Well, are you, is that make you crazy well i will start let me qualify bef before i say anything nasty or otherwise i i want all tanneries to be busy like especially tanneries in the u.s like i think that i think that everybody does has their strengths and there's there's a way there are ways for everyone to be busy and to do good work so i don't i don't even if I'm, if I take issue with, I don't know, even like Ricardo making Cordovan, and I, don't, I didn't necessarily need to pick on them, even another tannery making Cordovan, you know, I want, I just want them to make it their own way. Like if they make it their own way and it's nice, I think that's good. And then let people, there's a different application or a different customer for everybody. I think that, I think that I want everyone to be successful. It's like, I like a cyber truck, but you're like, I'm more of a Honda Civic kind of guy. I get you. All right. No, it's more like, <laughs> it's more like you want Jason at maker to do well too. Oh, I thought you were talking about the end customer to make their own choices of like, okay, I'd like, Oh, that there's I that like too. This one I'm talking, I'm just saying from where I'm sitting, you know, what's funny. My, uh, on that same topic, I had a customer come in yesterday. He had a craft and lore wallet. He goes, I'm sorry, I have your customers or your competitors wallet. I'm like, it's not a competitor. Like anybody making stuff out of nice leather, I'm supportive of. Like, I just want to share the leather and like have people make great stuff. So th is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think I just, I think that there's a place that there's, uh, there's enough space for everybody to be yeah. successful, I think is. It's so hard I'd, enough as it is. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not trying to, to tell anybody their business or that they should be doing something different or a different way. You know, I, we do what we do because we think that's the right way to do it. And you, you get someone else that comes into your place and you're like, you guys are insane for doing it like this. Like, why would you ever do it this way? It's like, well, that's the way we want to do it. It's the way we like to do it. We think it's that we think that's a combination of the best product along with our skill set. I mean, that's sort of where we're at. So I think that as long as anywhere in the leather world, as long as people are trans, not maybe transparent, not even the right word. As long as they are accurately representing 
the product that they're selling and they're selling it for what it actually is that I can't, I I have no, I have no, I have no, there's no, it's not my place to get mad or upset. I mean, I can get, I can get frustrated that someone's trying to take business away from us or to, you know, create a substitution that's cheaper, which I guess is kind of the same thing, but also that's kind of like business. I mean, I can't, it's not, Yeah. but if you, if, if, and this, we've run into this with tanneries overseas, where if you are saying it's the same thing, we make it the same way we use the same things. And it's, um, this is our version of Chrome XL. And like you say, it's our version of Chrome XL, but it's 26 feet and we can make it in two weeks and it's hot stuff. And it's like all these things it's like, well, it's not the same because there's no, you can't, you can't make it's different enough that you can't do you can't make the product that way it just doesn't there's no way to execute it that way that i'm aware of at least and we've got a little bit of experience making the stuff so but if you say like this is this you know if you want something that looks like a pull-up leather on the shelf and is bigger and cheaper and we can deliver it in two weeks and this is a great option don't say it's the same thing. That's that's where I start to get annoyed. Right. But it's the skip horween, uh, you know, what cow is the almond milk coming from? Right. Yeah, it's the same conversation, <laughs> the vegan leather. It's the same, it's the same thing. Just be just put the right information out there. And because yeah, then you start to to try to trick people, and that's where I start to get a little bit. Yeah. That. If people are being shown substitutions and saying that they're the same thing or they're almost the same thing, people should try them out and yeah. make make up their own mind. I think, I mean, not to sound arrogant, but I'm confident enough in the product that we make that I think it warrants, it's more expensive, I think it, but I think it warrants the increased price. Yeah, I tried so the, to- the, the increased lead time is, is a tough thing to sell. Cause that's, that's kind of our problem. Like we, we need to be able to make the stuff and deliver it in a more timely way. And we're working on that, but that's, that's an, that's an issue for us. I noticed that, uh, I think what you're saying reminds me of something that I've experienced with the, with the shell cord of, and a lot of people ask me like, why, why do you only use Horween stuff? This other tannery has this color that I want. And I'll tell them like, look, I can, I can, do that for you, but I don't think you're going to like it as much as the quality for these, these reasons. And I don't like to, I think we're both pretty like overly kind. Like we should pro- probably be more aggressive about our opinions and like call things out. But like, I don't really see the value in like diminishing somebody else to make myself look better. So what I did is years ago, we did a video comparing all the, all the different tanneries Cordovan from around the world, but didn't name them. And then just like talked about what we saw. And I think that is how people experience in footwear, for example, just wear it and try it. And there's a reason, I think there's a reason people look to you guys as, you know, the, the standard for what Cordovan ought to be. And that's not to say other people can't make a nice Cordovan product. It's different. So yeah, it's different. But I think a lot of it is also that like everlasting nature of like, how, how does this stuff age? I really feel like John Colton told me this. I think I've mentioned on the podcast a bunch. He's like, Horween puts a lot of material into the leather, which is very unique. And I think it's that additional material, maybe imparted from hot stuffing, that is creating that, I don't know if better is the right word, but aging in a way that is pleasant, where it's like, wow, I keep wearing this thing. It looks different and it looks cool. Or some, some footwear that I've worn, I wear it, it looks different and sometimes it just looks stupid, you know, but there's something like Chrome Excel, for example, and my indie boots that I've had for a decade and a half, like I wore the hell out of those things. The grain is all busted up. Like, it's like kind of loose, but not like super coarse, but it looks all like, it just looks used and like historic, <laughs> you know, I don't know, kind of epic looking the more I wear it. Um, I would assume that has a lot to do with the hot stuffing. Yeah, and also, I mean the, the finishing too. I mean, it's the aniline nature of things, and and the shoemaker, and and not 
and 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 it's not everything. buffing it and not painting it and not sealing it up and then yeah the shoes that it's going into and you know even down to how it's being worn i mean the, like my fit is actually not correct in those shoes i was indicating but yeah. it's all of it yeah it's a lot of little things yeah i think that i just think that I mean, I just think I just want people to be honest about what they're selling and not, I think that when you start, when you start to mislead a customer knowingly or not, which I guess is the the tricky part of it, things start to get very slippery. And then with the internet, the way that it is, it gets to be very hard to like put, not that it's my job to like set the story straight out there, but you know, there's so much conflicting information and then there's a lot of people that know enough. Like if you know ninety percent of the facts, and then you are the last ten percent, like you people aren't gonna people that have no idea aren't gonna be. They're gonna sound like you're gonna sound like you're a professor. Like it's, it's not. there's so it's, some really well informed people. There are yes, say that yeah, too. It definitely. Maybe the other thing is like I've noticed like I welcome questions. So I'm sure you and your team at Horwin answers questions too. So if like people want to know. Tell me the truth about blank. Like you guys will reply and answer them. So like, it's not like people can't reach out to you guys or anybody to, from the tannery to get like direct information. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think that if, if people have specific questions about how our products compare to other products, like a specific question, I would have an honest conversation about that. I still, I don't know if I want to like, just like, you don't want to blast somebody. I don't want to, I don't want to make a direct comparison between our product and another product. I just don't think it's very, I don't think it's in good taste or maybe, maybe that's what I should be doing. We if I was a smart business, different, right? Maybe if I was a smart business person, that's what I'd be doing to protect my, <laughs> protect my business. But I don't know. I just tell people like, what's the benefit of mine over a competitor's like ours does this. If you're looking for that, that might be what you want. If you're not, then it might not be worth the premium or yeah. the wait time or whatever. Is let the customer make the choice. That's that's how I f- feel comfortable comparing myself or my products, not myself, <laughs> to other products. It's not like a personal thing. Um, but the question, original email question, was about the smell. Yeah. So you're not adding like it was a big tangent. It's a, like a thirty minute tangent. Yeah. You're not adding like artificial flavorings to get like a great smell. Or where's the smell come from? The smell is coming from in the case of Chrome XL. It's coming from the hot stuffing. It's coming from the oils and the greases, mostly. I mean, there's you get some some like tal- like a lot of tallow. The yeah, the lanolin and the different waxes and the, the you know the finish has smell too. Like the dyes, like everything has some smell. When you, like, if you get a pair of Chrome XL, whatever, whatever boots or shoes, and you open the box, like that smell that you're getting will be a combination of like the shoe polish. I usually smell adhesives. And then, if it's depending on who, yeah, there's, there will be glue because that's, that's the last, uh, one of the last things that's gone on on there. But if it's a, like, if it's a welted shoe, there's glue, but there's not like crazy glue or strong, very strong <laughs> cement. Yeah, not bad. gorilla glue. Not gorilla. <laughs> uh, but you'll get like that, that sweet smell is the stuffing blend. I would really like to find out where the scent is coming from on the chill cordovan because I've mentioned this before too. Encapsulating that into a candle, gold mine. Right? Yeah, I think there are a lot more. The cordovan is since it's been so much time. In the pits, it smells like sweet tree barks. Yeah, I think like, there's a, you get a lot more of the tree bark, yeah, the, the tree bark component that comes through. Still a lot, in, in, or still in part in the chrome cell too, because it's, it's also a veg retanned. But you know, a, a one day full veg retanned is different than a sixty day pit tannage. It's a different thing entirely. Yeah, if there's any scent makers out there, or candle makers that can do exactly the scent, hit we'll, me up. We'll send you some. My dad <clears throat> tried to make a candle. I guess everyone has. I've seen this. You try to make a candle out of the stuffing blends. It burns so hot. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. It's not. You have to like add in a bunch of paraffin to make sure it doesn't. And then it just like scorches it. It's because it's not you like know, a torch. Lanolin is not supposed to be or tallow. Like it's like an oil lamp. Like an, yeah. <laughs> from like ancient Egypt. Like you're not. 
<laughs> you're not like making it's a little different but it, it smells doesn't, doesn't necessarily smell the same this is because well, you're burning yeah. it like it's not like an like a plug-in air freshener maybe that's the move maybe we just need to uh, team up, up with glade glade yeah. it, that's why do we both think of the th- same name are they the only I air know. freshener pl- people i guess i i guess not but I, who's they, the guy that makes the pine trees uh for the cars we should call that guy up you know the ones that like you go to a taxi and someone gave me like a leather scented one as a good as a gift one time i was like thanks thanks <laughs> <laughs> I don't get enough of, <laughs> yeah. of the smell. It's like I'm time. sure I'm sure this uh brown pine tree smells much better than the actual leather <laughs> <laughs> that I could just put in my car if you, I wanted this smell. You know what's crazy too is like I, I, I mentioned that I went on a, a trip to Tahoe for, it was only for like a couple of days, but coming back you forget the leather scent. It's pretty it's pretty interesting how our brains turn off the smell when you're just familiar with it all the time and then I have people walk in the door and they're like this place smells amazing I'm like that okay we just forget i read something there's an evolutionary reason for that you tell well because if you are constantly noticing like a like a novel smell then your brain is like spending time processing that information uh, and then you also can't smell other stuff so there's a reason there's i guess nose blindness has a purpose. You would tell me if I smelled bad, wouldn't you? I would tell you. Not, maybe not on camera. Not on camera. <laughs> or maybe, 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 maybe the next cold open. Right <laughs> at the beginning, I'll tell you. You smell like crap. You smell. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to start with favorites? Uh, do you have a favorite? I was supposed to be thinking of one, and I forgot again. Okay. Uh, you go first. I'll have one in a second. I, uh, I purchased a, a new instrument. That you were actually asking me about. I'll pull it out. My wife uh, told me that I don't do a good job of, of like treating myself or like buying anything really. Like literally nothing. That's nice wife advice. She's like, you need to like just chill out. Like, uh, so anyways, we, you know, decided to go on a trip that we booked and haven't been on yet. And I've purchased some uh, instruments. This is... <laughs> This is one of them. Uh, it's very different than every other uh, bass guitar that I have. Most of the stuff I have is like just wood. It's just like hardcore. Like there's a spalted maple uh, wood over there. There's like swamp ash. And the one behind me is uh, Weng, uh, Wenge. And I don't know. It kind of looks like walnut color. I forget what it's called. Yep. O- Oven call, I think is what it's called. I was thinking for this bass, and all those basses have like a different character to them in the same way that the leathers have different characters. Like somebody would come down here like, why do you have five basses? Well, they like, they do a different vibe somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> and they look different. So anyways, most of the stuff I have is like a little bit more like classic sort of vintage sounding. This bass, um, it was a new bass. It's, it's called the A2 from Kiesel. They're made in San Diego. And they basically ripped off another brand that has become successful called Dingwall. And Dingwall ha- has uh, a special preamp inside of it, um, which is sort of voiced in a certain way. So there's like a bass knob treble or mid and treble. And then there's these three pickups and you can select between each of them. Basically, Dingwall was just catching fire with people playing like more modern, like aggressive metal type things more modern players are going to Dingwall and I think Kiesel noticed like, well, we could do that same thing. But for decades, Kiesel has never had like really great electronics or pickups. I think they've found the answer finally because this thing sounds great and it sounds very modern. But because of that, I wanted to make it look actually ironically like not modern. It kind of looks kind of 90s or 80s a a bit. (laughs) But for people only listening to this, it's a bright ass pink. I think it's called hot pink. And then it has this b- black crackle finish on top of it. So I think what they do is they they stain or they paint the whole thing pink, and then they put some sort of black finish on the top that shrinks in on itself. And I mm. bet you they I bet I don't know how they do it. I bet they use some sort of heat gun to like melt the black, so it crackles up in an interesting way that kind of looks like I don't know like 
workout pants from the nineties or something that your mom wore. I was thinking, know? I was thinking like <laughs> macho man, Randy Savage yeah. had, had those pants, like exactly those pants. It's cool. I like it. So this, this is my new favorite and uh, I'm really happy um, that it actually sounds good because the last one I bought that looks beautiful does not sound, sound great. And you were asking about like, what'd you say earlier? Like, Hey, the strings that like, no, I was guitar said, strings. Cause you've got, you've got a bunch of bass, bases over there and then there's one guitar and the guitar is next to the bass and i was like why is the guitar neck so short yeah <laughs> and the answer is it's always that short well, and and i just i i just i don't know it's not, strange because i like i like music enough and i feel like i've watched enough music and i just have never known i just it's like one of those things i've just never noticed it's sort of a physics thing like the mm -hmm. the lower the frequency of the note the longer the the vibration so like you could get a low frequency note with a with a tiny short string, but like it would be so floppy that it wouldn't be able to control it. So a longer scale length yep. gives you like a nice tension on the string, which actually leads to the other cool thing about this bass is it's it's called a multi scale bass. Some people call it a fan fret. So it has different scale lengths for each string. So the bigger, fatter string on this bass vibrates like crazy far you can see how much it's vibrating and it has a longer scale length than the the smaller string up here anyways it keeps the tension like a little bit more consistent and easy to play cool there's your bass tangent what's your favorite uh i'm gonna go i'm just gonna keep talking about these headphones because i like them a lot and they're for sale right now <laughs> yeah we but gotta sell some headphones these, for Nick. these uh i've got these grado headphones i'm wearing right now and the the wood ear cups are made from tan old tanning drums that we had milled down. And then the headband is Cordovan. And the headband is kind of like, oh, it's just kind of like a, a, a way to elevate it. But the wood, I think the wood actually sounds awesome. Like we did, we, we tried them. a couple of different kinds of wood and this sounds so good. And so it's not just like, it's not just a novel thing. I mean, it, it is also kind of like a, like a fun thing to use a salvaged piece of wood, but it sounds good in there. I remember you gave me the ones you're wearing now to try and you were wearing the purple heart ones. And I was kind of mad. I was like, Oh, this purple heart looks so cool. Cause it's a great shade. But I remember I was listening to them. I was like, these sound good. And then I came to your office and you had those. And you're like, you should try these now. I put them on. It was night and day. They're, yeah. they're just punchy and beautiful sounding. Maybe, I don't know if it was had to do with your, your amp you had there. I, we well, tested I, it here too. I tested them multiple places on and on and both on that amp and then both because there's a break in period for these drivers and I, I broke them both in listening to the same songs, my same like <laughs> heavy metal They're metric songs and like brutal. other yes and and it, like it just sounds the the only my only the only thing about these headphones is they're not very portable because of like how they're constructed and how big they are. And also whatever you hear are hearing the person next to you will hear yeah. because they don't isolate it at all. But that's part of what makes the sound so good because it's not trapping all the sound against your head and you're not getting extra sound. You're only getting the sound that's going into your ear and then everything else is going away from you. There is something about those grados with the open back that makes you feel like you're in the room that was being recorded. And it's like very um, immersive. I'm really excited about them. I think that, you know, it's just like, like a, they're for sale on our, if you on the Horween site under shop and it's a pre-sale. So if you order them, we have to get them made because they're, it's a, you know, it's a limited thing and they're custom more or less, but they're worth, they're worth checking out. They're awesome. Oh cool, man. I'm still enjoying them more so now than I was when I first got them. I, Shameless plug slash favorite. Yeah. Love it. Well, thanks for another episode. I'm going to go slap the bass. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, by the way, everybody, if you want to leave your questions and comments, leave the comments on YouTube videos, which you're probably watching here to see this crazy base. I'm sure you came over just to see this monster. Uh, leave comments about uh, things you want us to talk about because we love answering those questions. And the emails like today's, who is the emailer today? It just says L. L. Some people wanted to be like anonymous too, and I, yeah. I get that. So if, if you want to leave us an email, um, any questions you might have about your shoes, I don't know. I'm wearing some 316 denim right now. Ask us the questions. Or if it's like guests you want to have on, we'd like to have some guests back again too. Yeah, and we'll 
We'll do another question and answer episode too. So, yeah. so we just picked one question because it sort of was in line with what we were talking about, but I like doing those question and answer episodes. Those are fun. All right, let's rock it out. See you later. Bye-bye.